We'll open this work session of the December 6, 2011 Board of Commissioners. Uh, we have on our work session two items for discussion. One is discussing proposed amendments to Chapter 9 of the City Bonery Code of Ordinances to create a new subchapter related to synthetic cannabinoid and agonists or uh, other items. I'll turn this over to Mr. Waltrip who has brought this to our attention. Thank you. Uh, what happened in uh, the spring of this year, there was a lady uh, that contacted all of us in regards to a substance that uh, a family member of hers had uh, had uh, purchased and she was concerned about how it was affecting him, how it was affecting their family. Uh, I just happened to get a hold of the lady first so I took the lead uh, for the Board of Commissioners and uh, had several uh, email conversations and phone conversations with the lady and uh, after talking with her and, and uh, coming to the conclusion that there may be some issues with this particular drug, whether it was legal, illegal, obviously didn't know from what she was saying, I contacted Tommy Loving with the uh, Bowling Green Warren County Drug Task Force. He actually sent someone to purchase the, uh, the substance, uh, sent it to the lab, and found out that it was actually a legal substance. And I'll cut to the chase. Uh, over a period of months, we've been hearing more and more about the, the synthetic uh, cannabis or synthetic marijuana. And uh, that, this is not only a Bowling Green issue, this is uh, Owensboro, Paducah are taking up this issue. Uh, we've been in touch with the, uh, with the drug uh, 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 group up in Frankfurt. And uh, what we'd like to do today is just uh, have uh, Tommy Loving is going to open up and tell us a few things about this. And then we're going to have uh, someone who has been, uh, family has been uh, affected by this. And then after that, then we'll decide what direction that we want to go in for any f uh, future uh, issues with this, uh, with this substance. Tommy, would you like to come forward, please? Well, thank you, Commissioner. And I'll take the liberty of, uh, since right now this is not an illegal substance, let me pass it around at $35 an ounce. And if when you get back, if you just state your name and your location, please. Certainly. And make sure you get that back, whether it's legal or illegal at this point. I'll, you know, I'll be watching closely, right. Commissioner. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought that somebody was supposed to put yeah. it in my pocket. I'm Tommy Loving, Director of the Bowling Green Warren Thank County you. Drug Task Force. Uh, as you said, you called me and we uh, sent a detective out uh, to purchase this. And we had also started hearing from some of the ER docs that they were at times having as many as 10 people a week come into the uh, ER. And I think uh, I'll let Amy address that personal experience there, but it's, it's very similar uh, with the different reactions people are, are coming in there having that uh, we thought we, we better take a look at this. So one of the detectives went out and purchased this substance as you can see, the lab did test that, and they took a minute amount out of it, but you're talking about $35. They sell this at times as potpourri. I don't know. I don't think my wife would go for $35 an ounce for potpourri, so it's, it's basically a ruse. Uh, I'd, I'd also think the businesses that are selling this, we've, uh, between uh, Amy, ASAP, and the task force, have identified 13 different uh, businesses selling this in town and uh, I have no problem making the statement they know exactly what they're doing they're making money off a, a drug that should be illegal it has serious consequences and their concerns for money and not public safety uh, as we've been told when this uh, is ingested it can affect the brain liver kidneys and even cause the lungs to stop working so uh, we, uh, of course, talked to you, looked in, and requested an ordinance, and I'm sure you'll explain yes. shortly how we're headed in that. Also talked to uh, Jody Richards about this and uh, probably explained that there will be, a, he has a bill ready to file. He'll pre-file it either next week or the week after. That will address this statewide. And the reason we're coming to you, be coming to the county, is uh, we don't want to wait till April or May because uh, we're, we're pretty confident talking to Jody, talking to the Office of Drug Control Policy that uh, this law will pass statewide 
but even with an emergency clause, we're looking at April or May. We'd like to get this, this drug out of Warren County, Bowling Green and Warren County, immediately. So uh, with an ordinance, either city or county, I'm hopeful we could accomplish that by the first of the year. Uh, and, and also, just let me interrupt you, what this will do, too, is, is uh, bring awareness to, to uh, people in our community what this mm -hmm. substance is, mm -hmm. so that uh, if some kids are involved in it, maybe uh, parents or guardians have a little bit more idea of what they're, what they're using. I think it will. I think it will really help that, and to the credit of the media, uh, Debbie Howland here with the Daily News, Channel 13 have run some stories on it and, uh, and, and I think made people much more aware. Now, what I passed around today is called 7-H. Uh, we went out and purchased another uh, drug recently called Diablo. Well, I've got the lab reports here if you'd care to see them. It's the same chemical compound, just a different name. So uh, without me belaboring the point, I think Amy makes a, a really powerful case. She and her daughter and her daughter may be here. Uh, I think she's, in, uh, she's a uh, WKU freshman and in class, and, and I'm sure we all want her being educated, and uh, they, they've certainly made an impact around town making people aware of how, how bad this stuff is. Might also mention, Amy just shared with me that uh, she will be uh, headed for New York tomorrow to appear on Anderson Cooper Thursday night, or they're gonna tape it, about this uh, synthetic drugs. And just the last thing I'd say, uh, this is, a, I guess, an ever-changing field here. The legislature addressed the K2, the spice, last year by chemical structure. We think in the language that we've submitted to the city and county uh, that was used in the state of Oregon, it's been reviewed by the Office of Drug Control Policy, that we can make a coverall so that we're not having to run back to the legislature or run back in here every six months because they uh, changed the chemical structure. So uh, with that, uh, any questions? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Tommy, uh, <clears throat> does it look like from uh, talking to your counterparts across the state that we are going to be taking the lead on this? Uh, are we? Uh, the I think uh, I think Paducah may <clears throat> and Owensboro may actually beat us in this regard, uh, but not by much. So uh, it it looks like they're going to address it too, and I'm. I'm not a, I'm personally not aware if it's passed there yet or not, but I know uh, they do have the ordinance drafted and whatnot. So uh, I'd like to see us be first, but I can settle for third. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. All right. Amy, would you like to come forward, please, and just Commissioner? May yeah, I'm sorry. May I ask just a couple of questions, Mr. Loving? Sure. Just so that I, I don't get people out of order. Uh, can and, and it may be putting you on the spot and if you don't want to do it if you'll submit it to me and I'll read them and take the liability do you have the names of the 12 or 13 places in Bowling Green that currently sell the substance mm, I, yes sir I, I asked for this reason uh, working in juvenile delinquency all my life I've, I've come to understand and, and being a parent of a teenager myself that just like Commissioner Waltrip spoke about a, a lot of times parents don't know what to be looking for and so they may tell their parents they're headed to a particular location to do something and if the parent had more knowledge about where they were headed they might head them off from going there if you would read those 12 to 13 places into the record I would appreciate sure. it with the only caveat we've identified five or six of these Amy has identified the others and shared that with me and she can tell you what they they did to uh, do it but Canarney Liquors Smith's Grove Travel Center the Lava Lounge, the Hookah Lounge, that's where we bought ours, uh, Jumping Jacks, Tobacco America, T-Mart, Raceway on Scottsville Road, Lost River Liquors, Easy Liquors, uh, 231 uh, Market and Liquor Store and Red Barn Liquors. And so some of those places are just gas stations, what, what, what most people would think is common gas stations. Mm. And, and I think it's important that their names be read into the record mm. so that parents have some understanding that I think often we think about the purchase of substances like this, whether they be legal or illegal, that are done in some back alley on some street corner, you know, with, with somebody who's trying to cover their face. This particular substance can be purchased in a gas station in full view of, of, 
of the police and anybody else who wants to look. And so I appreciate you reading those into the record. And I think uh, Amy would, would probably, she shared with me, when we sent one of our detectives, he looks pretty shabby anyway, as our detectives are supposed to look, so he, he was not questioned. I have an idea if I went in with my suit on right now, I might have a little tougher time purchasing it, but they're aware of what they're doing, and uh, as with too many uh, issues, you know, this is about money, again, not about public safety. Uh, there's certainly one convenience store firm here uh, that doesn't sell this, Fred Higgins, I'll, I'll mention him. He doesn't have this stuff in his stores. And, you know, I think we all know Fred's always been a good citizen. Thank you. Okay. Amy. My name is Amy Stillwell, and I am the parent of Ashley Stillwell. I appreciate you all letting, letting me be a part of this today. Um, I just want to share with you what happened to my daughter that um, pushed us to try to make a difference and, and get something done here. On August 21st, um, she and some friends were getting together before they all started college. It was on a Sunday afternoon, and um, about six o'clock, I started trying to call her, and I couldn't get her. For about two and a half, three hours, I continued to try to call her, and I still couldn't get her. And about uh, nine o'clock, I finally got a hold of her, and she sounded very sleepy, just not, you know, told me she left her phone in her car. I said, you need to come home now. So she calls me back about 20 minutes later, and um, of course, as a mom, I'm aggravated with her, and I said to my younger daughter, take the phone to your dad. So she did. I hear him say, you smoked what? So I jump up. She had called us to come get her. So we, we go to get her. At this time, it's, you know, 9.15-ish, 9.30. Um, she was lethargic acting when we got to her. She rode home with my husband and I drove her car home. Um, when I got to her though, I asked her, I said, what did you do? And she said, I did 7-H. Well, where did you get it? The hookah bar. I didn't know what a hookah bar was. I didn't know what 7-H was, had no idea. So I have a friend who is on the sheriff's department. I called him and asked him what this stuff was and he was trying to get the information for me as I was driving home. We get Ashley home and we put her in the shower and she fell, hit her head. I thought, okay, well my friend is still on the phone with me and he said, you know, you, you might wanna take her to the emergency room and I thought, no, you know, I think she'll be okay. I take her in her bedroom, help her put her clothes on and she just kinda laid back. Well, I start talking to her and she's not responding to me. I mean, I got this close to her face and shook her, literally, Ashley, Ashley, wake up. And she finally started coming around. I thought, no, we're going to the emergency room. So we go, and I had the triage nurse come out and get her because I wanted her to see how she was. So we go in, um, you know, she kept complaining of her chest hurting. My chest hurts, I can't breathe, I'm cold. And she was obviously, I mean, she was vomiting. Um, so they take her in, um, they do an EKG and tell her that her heart is fine, she just needs to calm down. They didn't make us wait very long. I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, we go back to see the doctor and the first thing I said was, I want her drug tested. I want urine, I want blood, I want it all. Well, they did that. Nothing, nothing showed up because I was convinced that something else had been given to her other than whatever this 7-H stuff was. So the doctor comes in and he tells me this and he said, I'm gonna be really honest with you. We don't know a great deal about this and I've called poison control. And so really the only thing we can do is give her fluids and give her medication to keep her from being so sick. And I thought, okay, <laughs> you know, my daughter is laying here. She's on a heart monitor. I understand they're monitoring her, but you know, when you have to scream at your child to get them to respond to you, something's wrong. I mean, this is crazy. Um, we get home about 4.30, I guess, and um, she slept. And I, I, I'm sorry, she couldn't be here today, but she is working because I'd love for her to tell you her side. But 
Um, she didn't tell me until Tuesday of that week that she could hear everything that was going on around her. She said, I could hear it, but mom, I couldn't move. I couldn't move my arms, I couldn't move my legs, I couldn't do anything. She said, they poured water on my head, they picked up the couch that I was sitting on and tried to get me to fall off of it. Um, she said, they kept saying, your mom's calling, you better wake up, that kind of stuff. But what got my attention and what forced, you know, what made me really feel I needed to do something was one of the folks that she was with said, if she doesn't wake up in an hour, we're going to throw her in Barren River. And I remember I was driving down 185 and I looked at her and I said, do you realize had they done that to you, you would not be here today because you couldn't, you couldn't move, you could do nothing. And she was like, I know, I know, I know. And so that pushed me to you know, try to see if there was something that could be done about this. Um, the first person I called was Tommy Loving and he was very nice, very supportive. He told me that they had already been looking into it some um, and that you know they were, they were working on it. Well, I'm very persistent and so I didn't feel that, I, I just felt I needed to do more. So I started calling representatives. I, I talked with Mr. Wilkerson. He was one of the first people I talked to, I think. Um, but I ended up joining with um, Save Our Kids Coalition and they assisted us in the list that um, Mr. Loving read. We put a little task force together. We had a list. We, I, we had a list of, you know, identify the store, identify if it's visible or if it's behind the counter, how much is it, and what are the names of all the different kinds of the herbal incense are they selling. Um, this stuff has numerous names. It, and it's the fact that it's sold in a tobacco shop or um, a convenience store absolutely blows me away. There are so many po folks that don't know anything about this. And so Ashley and a gentleman who also was affected by 7-H and is very lucky to be alive, we have started to talk in, we've talked at Western at four classes now, we've been talking to schools um, trying to educate the, the parent or the students and in return have, have gotten a lot of response from parents, which is awesome, but they, it's still, people still don't know about it. So I do think education is definitely going to be something that needs to be ongoing. But um, as Mr. Loving said, we don't want to wait until, uh, until April for this to um, be banned here. We, we'd like for it to happen now. So your support would be greatly appreciated on this. Okay. Any questions for, for Ms. Steelwell? Let me, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, let me pick the story up uh, a little bit from there. Um, uh, there was an intention to submit an ordinance for, for the Board of Commissioners' consideration. But in the meantime, uh, we uh, developed some, or Tommy developed some other information uh, indicating that it was not just uh, issues within inside the city limits of Bowling Green. Uh, Bruce uh, uh, got with Amy Milliken and uh, again at the pleasure of the board but what I would like to suggest uh, is this board uh, on the 20th uh, enter, uh, I'll enter a resolution supporting the county and have the county do the ordinance and there's there's many benefits to that one there's one ordinance to to uh, uh, to deal with uh, the wording will be obviously one way so there seems to be a lot of uh, uh, good aspects to doing it that way we also not just speaking with Amy we spoke with Chief Doug Hawkins with the Bowling Green Police Department and had his input involved in this again folks from the state level and so that's what we'd like to do and I will say that from what I understand about this drug, that Ashley's effects that she had are, are, are very similar to what other, other people are having with this. So with that being said, uh, also I think there were three LSU football players at one time this season that were suspended for using this. So there's all sorts of issues with this. And uh, I'm hoping that the uh, fiscal court uh, will take this up on the 16th. I'm led to believe that that's what will happen for a first reading 
uh, Tommy has uh, uh, talked with uh, uh, the county judge. Uh, of course, Amy's been in contact with him and, and getting his support and the magistrate's support. So with all that being said, we just wanted to hash this out uh, today to say what the city's involvement in this would be and to let the commissioners, uh, let all of us hear directly from Tommy and Amy and then decide what to do. Any other questions, comments? I have no objection to the deferring to the county on the 20th. Okay. Everybody on board? Okay. All right. Thank you all very much for being here. And our next item will be the uh, discussion that we have on our leasing proposal for Paul Walker Golf Course. Mr. DeFebo will have a presentation for us and we'll grant him the courtesy of finishing his presentation and then we'll ask questions. May I also, before we get that one last comment, I, Tommy had mentioned the media, but I'd like to recognize uh, the members of the media in the uh, uh, and particularly Deborah Hyland and her articles that have been in the Daily News on this issue that has really uh, 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 spawned a, a, lot of, a lot of public comment on this. So the media, you all have done an excellent job with this issue and I'm, I'm sure it's appreciated by many people. Good afternoon. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Uh, hopefully, you have before you uh, a packet of information uh, concerning the, the possible uh, privatization of, uh, through a request for proposals of, of one or more golf courses in the city, that being Paul Walker and or Riverview. Um, in the packet should be uh, a, the PowerPoint I'm going to present. Uh, a draft RFP, uh, uh, financial information uh, by, uh, put together about all the golf courses, uh, Mr. Greg Gary's uh, request or uh, letter of interest, the park board's uh, recommendation, as well as some ancillary information. Um, I will be the main presenter, but other people will be answering questions, that being Katie, uh, Gene Harmon, uh, Jeff Meisel, uh, possibly Bob Jeffers, and, and Ernie Gubis. I think all across America, anybody who's involved w with uh, golf, whether that's uh, public or private, is asking the question, how can we make golf courses more profitable? Uh, because what's happening is that many golf courses are under stress, whether they be private or public courses. This has become a fairly significant issue uh, within the golf industry, uh, and there's been a lot of study uh, allocated uh, to that. Um, and it's, there's been a number of solutions suggested, uh, for example, going out to an RFP, uh, closing golf courses, privatizing them, uh, privately managing them, and this is, uh, cuts across both public and, and private I issues. Even here in Bowling Green, uh, the issue is, uh, is significant both on the private level and on, on the public level. Um, and it goes back, as far as I'm told, uh, since the opening of Crosswinds back in 1990 when people had questions about uh, how much public golf should we have. Uh, recently, there was a request, uh, unsolicited request, given to the city by Mr. Greg Gary uh, to uh, entertain the idea of leasing and privatizing the Paul Walker Golf Course. Um, that request was sunshine to the commission, and it was felt that the first people who should review that uh, should be the park board, and I believe some of them are here today. Uh, it's important to realize that it was the park board's job and its only job was to look at the Greg Gary proposal. It was not designed to be uh, study all the overall needs of the golf system, the golf division, the impacts or alternatives. And there was a give and take between Mr. Gary and the park board. I think that it went over about a seven week period. I think some of you here were involved in that. And the park board, uh, 
in your packet uh, delivered a written statement and its first feeling was that they believe that Mr. Gary's proposal to privatize may not be compatible with Park and Rec's mission to be a, a service provider. I, I think that's an accurate representation of, of their opinion. They thought if you all, in your wisdom as the elected public body, wanted to move forward to privatize uh, one or more golf courses, it was incumbent uh, on this body and the city to do that in a public way through a public request for, for proposals. Uh, Gene supported that by way of opinion. It was also the opinion of the park board that the city receive a percentage of revenues and not a flat fee if there was going to be a, uh, a privatization agreement. There was concomitant uh, concern about the loss of public oversight over one of a sitting asset. And also there was a general belief that uh, Paul Walker would uh, not be a good fit uh, for this proposal. We discussed this and uh, we were instructed, staff was instructed uh, to start an RFP process uh, to further discussion along and also as a platform to uh, study uh, the overall issue presented by Mr. Gary as well as to solve the problem that I first presented you. What are we going to do about golf, if anything? Um, we thought it was important for all of us uh, to put together some value statements. This is a uh, this is a very muddy waters and it's uh, easy to lose focus about what your values are and what you're trying to do. We use a team approach, myself, uh, Katie, Gene, Jeff, uh, Bob Jeffers, Ernie, Anna Jones, uh, I think were the principal uh, people involved in that process. And we come up with the uh, sobering uh, realization that yes, privatization uh, could be acceptable to the city. Other places use it and it could be used here if it's in the best interest of the city and it reflects uh, your value statements as a commission in our community. Second, an RFP should be written to meet the city's golf issues, uh, not just one problem or request. Uh, we don't want to be here again a couple years later asking what are we going to do about another golf course. We wanted to put this issue as best as possible uh, to conclusion. We felt uh, for transparency that the RFP must be publicly bid and disseminated. But you need to go out and get interest uh, from uh, other people. We felt an RFP should be written to try to achieve the, the critical balance between the private sector respondents' need to make a profit as well as the, the public's need for reasonable control and oversight. As you will find, that is probably the central issue uh, of the RFP. Uh, any RFP should take into consideration the impacts on other courses. This is not a neutral process. Any, any changes to any of the golf courses will have changes to the remaining golf courses that we have. It's not neutral, it's not benign. It, it has impacts and so we wanted to make sure that the RFP is, as best as possible reflected uh, some of those, those issues. In order to look at what we're going to do about golf in quotes, the first thing we need to consider is, and people in the golf industry know this, there is an oversupply of golf holes in America. Uh, back in the 90s, there was a huge push uh, to add holes. As we all know, friends who went to Florida who wanted to live on a golf course and have a home right next to a golf course and money was cheaper and land was cheaper and golf courses were unnatural attractant. That also applied uh, locally uh, to uh, the addition uh, of golf courses here in Bowling Green where the number of holes is out of balance uh, with the amount of demand. If we neglect to reflect this reality in our RFP, we're really not solving anything. 
in your packet as an appendix, you'll see uh, a document put together by Mr. Jeffers and his staff about uh, the number of choices uh, the golfing consumer has within a one hour drive of bowling ring. There's approximately 77 courses, 1,404 holes that people can choose to uh, partake in. As we all learn in economics 101 is that uh, if there's more supply, uh, you have an issue with, with price. Uh, of these 77, 19 courses were added since we added our, our, our third course, which was Crosswinds, and that added 306 holes uh, to the amount of holes that are available. The impact of oversupply, it, it should be pretty obvious to anyone. Uh, if you have oversupply, you're going to be decreasing the amount of rounds played at any one hole. Uh, you're going to be increasing uh, golf deficit as a recreational uh, service paid by a fee for service. That's an important understanding. And finally, the cost to provide uh, a round of golf recovery-wise in terms of how much we, it costs us to provide that round goes up. This creates a deficit. Uh, numerous uh, things have been written or said about uh, the deficit at, at, at Paul Walker. And it's important to put that in perspective because I think it drives some of the argumentation here. A deficit occurs when the amount of revenue an activity produces is less than the cost to produce the activity. Cost recovery is the amount of revenue an activity produces from user fees. I go play golf, I play 18 holes of golf, I pay a fee. I'm recovering the cost of that activity through that fee payment. Now you can, depending how you look at deficit, you can factor it in many ways. Uh, we have chose uh, with a lot of effort uh, to try to look at operating deficit vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, deficit that includes operating cost uh, as well as the indirect cost spread. Uh, but that's important to look at, at, the, at the definitions of what you mean by deficit. Taking a simple detour before we get back to deficit, I, Bob has graciously provided us uh, this uh, course play at our city courses by uh, calendar year. Uh, as you can see, uh, the high watermark of usage of paying a fee for service for use of our golf course was in 2002. Um, and you can see the difference, for example, in crosswinds in 2010. We chose to use a calendar year because that is what the golf profession, according to Bob and others, uses to measure golf play. And you can see the incremental decline. You can also see the incremental uh, decline at Riverview. In fact, Riverview is probably the most dramatic of all the decline. Uh, Paul Walker also has shown a decline, but uh, not as severe. Uh, in that, what is that, roughly uh, eight-year period, uh, the city's uh, participation has decreased approximately 12,000 rounds. That means either people stop playing golf, which is a possibility because golf is not exactly a, a growth sport in many communities, or they chose to play somewhere else where, where there's more supply. Uh, this is a, a nice graph put together by your staff that uh, does it in, in, in color about the various golf courses. Blue is all courses. Uh, red represents crosswinds. Uh, Paul Walker is in, in green and Riverview is in uh, pur purple. I see something wrong. Yeah, a little Yankee slip out oh, of there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, you pull water. <laughs> sorry. I can't even do it. <laughs> Wacker. Uh, Wacker. Uh, now, back to oversupply and the deficit and the subsidy. This doesn't take brain surgery, okay? Decreased rounds equal to less revenue. 
and less revenue. If you're going to continue to provide the product, you've got to get the money from somewhere. That means a subsidy. If we were a private facility, uh, and, and Jeff and I had an opportunity to go to a local private facility, uh, that, which he's a member, uh, and learn uh, more about private play, uh, there are opportunities to diffuse a deficit uh, in a number of ways. For example, you can have uh, annual payments spread out over 12 months if you're a private course, or you could spread this to other uh, activities at the club, so to speak. Public golf courses generally do not have these tools. Again, using a, a medical term, we exist under what is called fee for service. The public pays a fee, we provide them a, a service. And generally we don't have any other uh, services, uh, other uh, revenue sources other than maybe some sales uh, of equipment and things at the clubhouse to help reduce, reduce that. It's important understanding. We laid this uh, foundation for you because, again, there's been a lot of discussion that Paul Walker is running the, this terrible deficit. A lot of discussion about Paul Walker's deficit. And uh, I guess we wanted to determine, is the deficit of Paul Walker the primary reason we are seeking to, pri uh, to privatize or consider privatizing is it the highest of all city courses and is that true or not true and in what perspective one big question that's been asked of your staff is to look at golf as a recreational activity and to compare that recreational activity in terms of two benchmarks one is cost recovery how much fee for service do people pay to use that activity? And the second is general fund subsidy. Uh, Ernie Gubus is the architect of this, uh, this chart, as he should be. And as you can see, uh, there's some interesting information provided here. Revenue, again, represents uh, money that is brought in fee for service by the activity itself, not from the general fund, and not from some other form of other people's money or payment. It's money we raise by the activity. Cost recovery represents that percentage that is raised. Subsidy represents that percentage which is not raised by fee for service or by cost recovery. Park and rec, as you can see, uh, requires about an 80% subsidy. If you look through this chart, you will see some very, very interesting uh, things. We present this information for you all in two ways. On this chart, we did not include debt service. And I will explain later why that is difficult. On another chart in your packet, you have encumbered inside the number uh, debt as, as we know it. But you can see, uh, even in, for example, at the cemetery, uh, we pay a four, uh, roughly uh, six out of every $10 to, uh, for a burial. Uh, and in um, soccer, we pay 97% uh, of all that activity. Uh, Parker Bennett, which we're very proud of, uh, we provide a good bit of subsidy there. Special Pops, which is Ernie, will, uh, tonight tell you about the great award we received. We subsidized that at 89%. Uh, depending on your value perspective, subsidy may or may not be a bad word. Some will look at it as the cost of providing services reflecting our value as a community and not necessarily a deduct. Depends on your values and on your perspectives. If you look at aquatics, uh, it's, a, it's a negative 20. It means we're making some money. But if you add debt, it roughly, the picture changes and becomes roughly equal to the total deficit uh, of golf. Here is your deficit, uh, not what has been said to be true, but this is what the, the numbers show. Uh, this was put together by one person and verified by two others. So we wanted to make sure that we had accuracy in that. Um, 
as you can see, the average subsidy uh, of all courses was 132,000. And you can see that the average subsidy for Paul Walker purported to be very high was $56,000 a year. Now, you have to understand that debt is not in here, nor is capital or indirect personnel costs. And there are very good reasons for that, and I will get to those shortly. The city uh, golf course, cost recovery. Remember the fee for service, we're supposed to pay for golf because it's a specialized service. If you go to Paul Walker, uh, you pay, the average golfer there pays 83% of the, of the cost of that service. At Riverview, he only pays 62%. At Crosswinds, 80% he pays. If you look at, at as on the reverse, the subsidy is the lowest at Paul Walker and the highest at Riverview. Then we put together, again, for your benefit, uh, an average so that one year would not spike uh, the statistics. And you can see there the average uh, for all the golf courses was 75.4, 24.6 for subsidy. Uh, not much different, in fact, somewhat better than others. Why is this subsidy uh, discussion important? Well, as I just showed you, 80% of all park and rec services are, are supported by our value statements uh, from the general fund to provide those services. About 80% of all of park and rec. Of that, uh, golf only takes, even including its debt, which is the highest at Riverview, only takes uh, about 40% uh, subsidy because we pay 60% of the bills through the golfers themselves. Uh, we were asked to look at one particular uh, parameter, that being the water park, park, pork, and, and versus uh, golf, and here, it's approximately equivalent. Golf in park, park is about equal. Uh, the average cost recovery of Paul Walker, the amount of money that we get from the golfer himself, the amount of money, is the highest of all the golf courses. And the subsidy is the lowest just the opposite of the facts that have may have been purported to be true. You also understand that if we're looking at wanting to privatize, uh, there's, some, there's one course that stands out, and it's certainly not Paul Walker. The one course that stands out is Riverview. Riverview has the av lowest average cost recovery, 62%, and the highest average subsidy subsidy of 38%. Some would say 62 is pretty good. When the debt is added in, which is about 68 grand a year, the cost recovery falls to about 53% and the average subsidy increases to 47%. Now, how do you deal with capital investment? Some courses have it, some uh, recreational activities have it or don't have it. You go back to uh, Economics 101 and the concept of sunk cost or sunk investment. At some time <laughs> of the history of all the courses, somebody, us, made capital investments in each one of those courses. Depending on when they were made, <coughs> they either can be reflected on the books now as debt, oh bad, or paid off and forgotten or sunk and from years before. Let's take Riverview. Riverview has an, a yearly mortgage of about 68,000, Jeff, a year. Uh, it, but Walker, as some of us who study the history there, have, has been the beneficiary of scores of years of investment. Most recently, we just re uh, renovated the clubhouse. And that's not shown as any kind of debt, but it is an investment. It is a capital. So if you really want to factor in capital, 
you need to go back to the start of each course and try to equalize the sunk investments vis-a-vis -vis the active investments. We could do that, uh, but it would probably take a, a, an actuarial or certainly more time than we had. Uh, we chose to try to identify where we knew debt existed and to go with what we thought was more valid, which was operating deficit and cost recovery. What you may or may not know uh, is that at our, uh, at our course, uh, two of our nine whole courses, we have what are called indirect costs. We have a golf division. We have administrative leadership of that division. We have services that are spread among uh, various parts of the division. Uh, and these are called indirect costs. These costs do not necessarily reflect the actual percentage of time allocated by each person to each course. Uh, this isn't something new since 2006. It's been something that has been done as an, an accounting practice uh, since uh, the opening of Crosswinds. It's important to deal with indirect costs because if you're going to privatize, you're still going to have to deal with the, uh, the base operating costs unless you're planning to make dramatic changes in those people's salaries or what they do or their employment. On the other hand, we as a public organization, if we privatize and change our golf division, uh, I have to understand that we're going to have to reconcile this indirect cost. Instead of three courses or two courses spread to indirect cost, you only have one. And if you absorb all the costs of one, what do you have now? Higher subsidy at that remaining course. Here, uh, which was not, I don't think, discussed in any documents, uh, maybe it was handed out and it was handed out incorrectly is the indirect charge-offs uh, to Paul Walker and to Riverview. It's approximately $70,000 at, at each course. It represents uh, both benefits, wages, and overtime. I chose not to use names. Uh, I think any of us who uh, are around the course know who these individuals are. Um, we also uh, have the same indirect uh, cost spread at Riverview. The, those, this issue was never discussed and left uh, orphaned to be handled later. It can't be left to be handled later. It has to be handled now, and we have to make decisions about that. We also have the direct allocation of a, of a golf professional, 50% at Walker and 50% at Riverview. It was, uh, I think, identified you as indirect cost. Actually, it's a direct cost. Uh, and these, again, do not necessarily uh, reflect that this particular individual spends 50-50. It could be 49-51. Uh, so just, it's more an accounting function. Based on what we thought our mission was, we uh, wanted you, first of all, uh, to have all the information. Because we felt that you were not getting all the information, at least initially, and that's no one's fault because we were just responding to one, uh, one response, one inquiry. <laughs> However, if you're going to do fixed golf, and if you accept the principle that there are uh, linkages and impacts between golf course and action taken at one, you have to reflect this in the RFP. Um, we did that and made some assumptions. I handed out to you tonight a, a list of questions that uh, came to me today in preparation for this, trying to think, how could I possibly make it easier to understand this raft of information? So you have some of the, the questions there. Uh, so Gene, uh, as I said, as our city attorney, wrote the RFP, and we had much discussion. We felt that it, sh it needed, it must be, it legally had to be uh, advertised uh, in the widest possible uh, market as it was appropriate. Uh, 
The second issue was we didn't want to write an RFP where no private respondent says, I'm not right, I'm not responding to this. This is all geared to the city. We spent numerous hours trying to balance what we thought was righteous between the city's need for control and the leasee's right to use the asset. Interesting enough, uh, many of those uh, balances were found uh, in either golf industry leases that we were able to find uh, on the net, and uh, more interestingly, from our own uh, convention center agreement, in which we have a lease there with a private company. And many or some of the protections found in that lease are also uh, found in this. Uh, if you saw the facts, the real problem is Riverview. We thought it would be irresponsible for us uh, not to uh, at least uh, put Riverview or both uh, as an option. If we're here to fix golf, reduce the subsidy, yeah, Riverview must be addressed. Uh, we agree wholeheartedly with the, the park board's recommendation that, that some uh, form of uh, revenue sharing be done. However, uh, we uh, allowed, if, if you want to, uh, different forms of payment, one of which is that, another is to use a trigger, and the third is to use what is called uh, a flat fee. If the RFP is awarded, it should be based on the amount of money. We should be getting something for doing this. This is our asset. We have sunk cost in that asset. We have created that asset. The public has paid for that asset. And we should get some payment for use of that asset. We should also be judging uh, who uh, would be privatizing one or both or none of our courses based on experience and uh, a plan to do proposed capital improvements. That was one of the initial attractions. We felt 10 years was an appropriate lease term because anything other than that, if you had a defeased debt uh, from a private side, it wouldn't allow much time to defease that debt. We didn't write this RFP as if once we wrote it, it was always gonna be in private hands. It's, uh, it's a fool's errand because as we know, uh, if golf courses are in peril, doesn't mean a discipline can't become in peril too in private hands. So we wrote it to protect the, the bless you, protect the city in case of default. Uh, beer sales would be continued to be allowed at Riverview if that is included in the RFP, uh, but it would be taken from uh, the city's name, obviously, into the private leasee. Uh, as much as we don't want to, we want to keep as many of our employees working. I know you all sweated blood when we had to lay people off and we got most of them back. The RFP doesn't guarantee or require a, a bidder to guarantee jobs. You know that. Uh, indirect costs themselves are not also uh, required to be covered by the leasing. That would be our burden or our responsibility, or our, our need. We, based on long deliberation uh, with our insurance carrier and our, our risk manager, felt that we needed a minimum of $3 million liability insurance. Uh, some could say that it's too high. Uh, the city requires five in other, other areas. We thought David and he's here tonight, if you have questions about his judgment on this, we felt $3 million was the reasonable quote unquote amount. We, this is our asset, we felt that we had the reasonable right to inspect the premises, and we had a reasonable right to expect it to be kept up to certain standards. What are those standards? I asked Bob and his staff to put together the standards that they uh, strive to uh, t uh, maintain the golf courses now. So we're not creating a separate gold standard that is un unachievable for any private person. We felt that the city uh, must approve all capital improvements o o over $5,000. <coughs> uh, 
uh, bless you. Again, this is what we have at the convention center. And also, metaphorically, if you let somebody borrow your truck and they want to change it and repaint it and uh, soup it all up, you, you want to make sure that you uh, check off uh, any changes that the person makes to your asset. Because after all, all they're doing is using it. Uh, parking would be shared under some agreement uh, with the leasee at, at Walker. The outstanding debt at Riverview would remain the responsibility of the city. Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, the real deficit is not what you see. Uh, the real deficit, and Kate can explain that if you have a question, is significantly higher because we don't let, we don't cover our debt, let alone our operating costs at Riverview. So it would be kind of uh, unreasonable to expect any private bidder to uh, eat that debt for us. But we would look at, for example, if we uh, looked at other options for Riverview to try to get some of that debt covered through other uh, ways. Uh, surety and performance bond. Gene's our lawyer. It was his recommendation that if someone says they're going to do something on the course and we made a judgment that, to give them the RFP based on that, what indemnification do we have? Uh, we're also said that uh, the per we're given a bid based on the X amount of money we're supposed to receive. We do not want to be in court just to get our, our, our check, so to speak. There's other considerations. Again, the seminal point I think that your staff wants to get, a, uh, get across is any unbundling from public golf will have impacts on cities. This is a normative statement. This is not that uh, unbundling is bad or unbundling is good. But unbundling, getting out of the golf business in any way will have some impacts on what we do in the golf division. For example, if you privatize Paul Walker, uh, you will significantly uh, impact the city's other courses. The course you will most significantly impact is Riverview. If the golf course is losing the most amount of money and has the lowest amount of play, and we give, we create a, a, a competitor who has the ability to use price, product, location, asset freely, uh, you can expect that our deficit will increase, if not put uh, Riverview out of business. Uh, Again, we do not have to be in the public golf business. Many cities aren't. But if we're going to do this, we need to do it and do it wisely. Uh, to that end, we, we believe after studying this issue for six weeks or more, staff-wise, if we sell, uh, and that's an option always, uh, uh, maybe not a popular one, or privatize Walker, we should expect to sell privatize or close Riverview. It's just, the numbers are, are there. There's not enough rounds, uh, as you can see by the evidence we've given you, support both courses. Now, there is an option. We can invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in Riverview uh, to improve the product there, take on more debt, to bring it to a state uh, that may be approachable to what you already or near have at Walker uh, and not have the advantage of location or uh, uh, price. We believe it's a bad gambit uh, uh, given the advantages if you privatize Walker that a leasee would have over the city. Uh, also be aware, if we privatize Walker and close Riverview, either because we, we discover either now or a year from now that we're losing a lot more money and it doesn't make any sense, you're going to have 10 to 12,000 former rounds played at Riverview. Those represent dollars. Some of those rounds will go to crosswinds or to other courses, uh, private courses but most are projected to go to Walker. This could be fine if this is what you want to do as long as there is some gross revenue formula 
negotiated at Walker. I, it just wouldn't make sense from a, from a general business perspective to put one out, so, put oneself out of business, and give the the revenue uh, to to the party that could put you out of business. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, privatization of Walker will create a number of personnel issues for the city. We're not an employment agency. I don't mean that uh, in a way that sounds flippant. We're not. We're here to provide services. But don't be deluded that if, if we privatize or privatize River also or close or sell or reorganize or restructure, you are essentially going to have to restructure the golf division. That is from severe restructuring to some restructuring. This is one of the hard realities of privatization that isn't talked about too much in the discussion to date. There's other option. A private lease is not the only way to reduce the deficit. If our hunt is to get the deficit down, uh, some cities, and we've spent many hours studying these management contracts, even places like Henderson, Owensboro, uh, a number of cities have attempted to uh, privatize their golf management and some have done it successfully. But often in times what happens is it creates conflict over the public versus private control. Thus, another option, and the one that I do not recommend, nor does uh, Ernie or any of us on our team, but if the issue is about uh, being perpetually stuck in some balance between reasonable public and private control, the best way to do it is get out of the nine hole golf business and use the money to make Crosswinds a world class facility. And that makes moot the whole issue of control. Okay, you're either half in or half out. Another option uh, that, w that is, is possible would uh, have the city, uh, for example, choose to close Riverview sometime in the future, reuse it uh, for a variety of recreational purposes, because after all, we still have the debt, and continue to operate Paul Walker ourselves. This would allow us to reinvest uh, Riverview's larger, larger deficit savings you, you save $150,000 off the bat, plus the orphan rounds, uh, the, the rounds that aren't played uh, anymore at Riverview, as well as the money that you would not have to invest. And it would leave the city with one nine-hole public course and one 18-hole course. That has a sense of symmetry and balance to it. Uh, again, this would require some restructuring of the golf division, but not at a significant level as privatization and closure of both Walker and Riverview. Uh, what's not up here is, uh, to use a golf term, we could stay at par. Uh, we do not have to uh, move forward with any RFP. Uh, Bob and Ernie's uh, requests from me and, I, and from, from the commission in the past has been to try to manage this course and keep our costs as low as possible. We've tried to keep that around the cost of living, but it's difficult given that we pay public wages. And that's, but that has been our goal. So it depends on your value statement. Uh, we're prepared to proceed uh, with the public RFP to see if there's any private interest in leasing one, both, or none of our nine-hole courses. Uh, one thought could be armed with these responses. You could determine whether or not uh, any of the alternatives meet the city's need or whether we need to take another look at, at, at the uh, golf deficit. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, and I'd like to sit down if I could and answer from here. Is that okay? Sure. My back's very important. Thank you, Mr. Febo. We appreciate the, the work and the clarification that you've provided for us there. I know it's not an easy issue to deal with, as evidenced by the people here to uh, find out about what's going on. Um, if 
the board has any exceptional comments that they'd like to bring forth. There's uh, 10 questions that the city manager would like to have answered. Do you want to do that first or do you want to do you have a comment? I just had one question that I wanted to follow up on. I sure, can wait now or? No, we'll go ahead. Mr. DeFebo, you indicated that the high water mark of play was in the year of 2002. I believe that's factually correct. Do you know or does anyone in the room know in the years since 2002, has, as play has decreased, what has happened to the cost of playing golf per round? Stayed stagnant, decreased, or increased? Um, I didn't study the revenue side of this. Uh, uh, Bob probably could speak uh, thoughtfully to that. If Bob's here? Yeah, oh, there he is. And I don't need exact numbers, just it's gone. It's, it costs more to play golf since 2002, or it's about the same? Uh, I can feel pretty confident it probably hadn't gotten cheaper. Since I'm hard here and ask me the question again. The high water mark of number of rounds played was in 2002. I'm asking about what did it, how much did it cost to play golf in 18 holes at say crosswinds in 02 compared to how much does it play, cost to play 18 holes at crosswinds in 11? Um, I could look back and give you a specific answer on that, but I would, uh, I would say at the Crosswinds 18-hole golf course, the rates between 2002 and the current rates is uh, one year we jumped like three or four dollars. I'm going to say it's probably a six dollar difference okay. in nine years and that the nine-hole course is uh, probably about a three dollar difference. Thank you. As we begin our discussion, I think probably the most telling item uh, and what you brought to our attention was the, the facts that rounds have decreased over the last 20 years by, if I counted correctly, 17,000 yep. rounds. That's, uh, uh, you know, sometimes there are ebbs and flows in, in what you do, and sometimes you, you have to adjust. Uh, like we didn't have a soccer park back in the, the 80s, but we built it now. It's probably the most used one out there. Is that not correct, Ernie? Right next to the skate park, right, Ernie? I know you get it in somewhere. <laughs> well, Mr. Febo's asked for uh, ten our answers to ten specific issues, and they may lead us to some other discussion. But uh, if you don't mind, we will uh, uh, take them in, in the you order that read you them? presented. And the first question is: uh, Would you require the private bidder to bid on either uh, of either one of the two golf courses or both of them together? Correct. Uh, make it that if you want to bid, you got to take our good golf course and our bad golf course, not just the good golf course. Do I have any, any comments from the board? Hearing, I'm, go ahead. I, I'm not interested in exploring a private bidder. Okay. I know that's not on there. Well, it's the first <laughs> half of the question. I understand. I don't. I don't know what we to do. We knew that going in. I don't know what to okay. do about that when when I'm <laughs> given four answers and one of them isn't mine. But uh, we, we we get to that question later. Okay. Uh, based on the non-response, I would presume that that all of those options are available. Yes, they're in the one RFP. One or the other or both. We didn't mandate that the, the private respondent uh, bid on both. Uh, but we can amend that to require that to be done. That will greatly reduce the field of people who will probably bid. But from, our, from a righteousness point of view, we, the greatest deficit, as you can see, is uh, Riverview. Why, why not, if we're going to solve the problem, not include that? It's, that's where the real problem is. That's and that's nobody's fault. It, it's, it's, it's a decrease of play. We have a great staff. I've played at, at Riverview, and it, they do a great job with the product there. It's just that it's, there's too much oversupply. Look at the chart of all the <coughs> golf courses. It's amazing. I was shocked. Uh, was Question number two is would you, we consider selling any of them? I would I'd like to take that off the table right now. I don't think any of us are interested in selling any of the city parks. The only response I'd have to that is that if we were forced into a corner that we had to, of the three golf courses that we have, it, and, and I don't know whether we're talking about selling or closing. I know the question selling. is I know the question is selling, but I, I think 
Do we get to closing yes. while you're in your questions? Yeah, I, I broke it down incrementally. I Have you not looked ahead? <coughs> I, should, I should read ahead. <laughs> the third question is, would you consider, consider developing a private management contract to operate any or all of the golf courses? And a management contract is different than a lease. Yes, management, management contract is they work for us for a fee, all right? We pay them, Gene, and you know it has an impact on our employees, but they are private employees, uh, and that's a possibility. A number of cities are doing that, but I said as it affects employees. Plus, there's the issue of uh, how much control. <laughs> is that not what we do at, at the convention center? Is a management contract? Well, it's called a management contract, but it's a little bit different. We don't actually pay them. They keep all the revenues, and they pay us a percentage of the revenues they collect. We don't actually cut them a check. They collect everything, but again, and then they send back, we're at 12% right now of gross revenue. Like a 12% of gross revenue they return to us. Uh, probably, if I'm, if I'm guessing at numbers, probably most of the RFPs you see out there may be management type where they actually pay. Uh, I'm not sure what the status of Henderson is. I know Owensboro several months ago went out on RFPs to manage. I think they received three, four, five responses, evaluate them, and decided not to pursue. Because I think they looked at it and said, we're running deficits now. This only increases our deficits because now we're paying somebody to operate our courses. So they backed off and did nothing. Mr. Mazel. We, we took a stab. I don't know if you recall. Some of you may have been here. We took a stab at uh, a management contract at the pool about four or five mm -hmm. years ago. And we ran into, Ernie can speak uh, probably volumes on it, but we ran into several problems there with the control. Uh, we, we had trouble with uh, employee versus uh, contract labor issues with, with holdings. And uh, like I said, it, 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 maybe we, we got a hold of a bad company, but it was uh, not a good experience. So. Did you have a question? Well, I, <clears throat> as you already know, I uh, some time back is expressed my concern about us selling uh, Paul Walker Golf Course, and uh, I talked with Greg about it, and as I mentioned before, if there's anybody in the world that could do something not only with a golf course, but in any other business, Greg Gary can do it. I have all the confidence in the world um, in Greg Gary, but I, I just don't. I guess the thing that bothers me most is that it would appear, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if we lease our golf course, then that lease golf course, even though it's still ours, is competing with the other golf courses that we own, as well as others that are out there somewhere, which I, you know I can help about those, but uh, but it puts us in a position uh, that we're competing against ourselves, and we don't do that. Uh, as an example, convention centers. Anybody brings a proposal in here to us pertaining to a hotel and convention center, uh, we put certain restrictions on them that they do not compete with our own convention center. So that's just my thoughts. Uh, uh, but, you know, I guess we could take a look at every department we've got and come up with a conclusion that we are probably losing money on it. Uh, we're in a service industry. I mean, that, that is what Bowling Green is all about and other cities, is that we are here to provide a service to the citizens of the community. Uh, we have new people come into this community and they want uh, uh, wrestling programs or dancing studios and, 
if there's enough people out there, then we, we have a responsibility to provide that service. But uh, uh, I think we, that's the main thing we need to keep in mind, is that we provide services, and some services we provide, we don't get no money back on it. Policemen, a fireman, uh, public works people, uh, they do their job, they do it well, and uh, we don't make any money on those uh, respective jobs. Okay, getting back to question number three, uh, is a private management contract one of the options we want to consider in the RFP as opposed to a lease? You're not interested in take that one off the table for the management okay. contract? The fourth question has to do with considering closing a course and repurpose it for uh, other recreational activities. Yes, sir. Uh, I would consider both A and B. Uh, Which is one of either of the two nine-hole golf courses. That's correct. That's possibly Walker only or possibly Riverview only. W one of the things that I've talked about for a couple of different years is I think golf is down nationwide. Uh, I think in a poor economy, it becomes even more difficult to afford golf. But I also think that in certain areas, certain municipalities, golf is down lower because we do not have adequate <coughs> junior golf programs or facilities for juniors to play in. Uh, the reason that soccer has boomed in Bowling Green is because we built a location for people to go and, and play soccer. Uh, I'm going to mention it again, but we have more skateboarders today <laughs> than we did four years ago because there's a place for them to do that. There's really not a place for junior golfers to feel comfortable. Uh, not that anybody intentionally makes them feel uncomfortable at the other nine hole courses, but sometimes they don't feel comfortable because they're priced out of the game. Sometimes they don't feel comfortable because their, their pace of play is considerably slower than adults and they feel like they have adults who are constantly encouraging them to hurry or hitting into them or whatever the case may be. One of the options, one of the things that I've talked about with Walker for some time is to keep it as a golf facility but alter, alter it in some way that it becomes a practice training facility that would include in some way some type of driving range. You would keep four to six, I don't know exactly how many holes, but it would encourage junior golfers to be able to come out and play. It would be a reduced rate because there would be, there'd be less holes that they would be playing. Uh, you, you might even take away carts in some cases, uh, but kind of a repurposing for other recreational activities on Walker, I would not agree with, but repurposing it in, in, in a different golf venue uh, seems to me to be a possibility worth exploring. Uh, I've, I've had multiple conversations with multiple people. The driving range may not be a possibility because the way that it sits close to residential houses and things, but I, I think there's something that, that we can do there that not only solves a portion of the problem in 2011, but solves a portion of the problem going forward as to where do our golfers come from. On option B, possibly Riverview only, I would, I would be supportive of exploring are there other activities that we can have at Riverview uh, that are not golf related. I like the uh, or in these possibilities, the possibility of Riverview only, uh, but not Walker. And although what Slim said about developing a more of a junior golf program I'm, does have some, seems like it is a good idea to use the existing Walker golf course and not changing it as dramatically, or not changing it, but have a junior golf program somehow. I think that's an excellent idea, but. Uh, I would not be in favor of closing Walker, and I would Riverview. Okay. I think. 
Michelle? I'd agree with that, but I'd also like to thank the staff at all the golf courses. They do a great job of tournaments for young people in the summer. Um, my son has played in those, and when he comes back, he says, you all have made them feel like professionals. So thank you for that. Um, and at all the courses, he has had nothing but compliments on how you all have treated him as a young person. So thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. Sir, so, do you have anything? No. Okay. Uh, if I get the consensus correct, the consider B and Walker for a junior program if it's available. Okay. And, and please don't misunderstand me. I'm not looking exclusively for juniors. I understand. But I think modifying the course in some way that juniors w would it, it would be set up more for juniors or people that are new to the game regardless of their age. If I could add a point, Jeff and I are both golfers. He's much better than me. We both said that we started on either par threes or executive par three courses. The next question we have to consider is whether to continue public operation of any nine-hole golf course. This is a default question. If yes. you want to default and just go back to par, eliminate the discussion any further. I think four. Or, I think question four pretty much covered that one okay. for us. Uh, would you consider closing Riverview, Riverview and continue to operate Paul Walker and Crosswinds by the city and its staff? Yes. Yes. And obviously that, that yes means, well, it's kind of superseded by number C if you're going to actually consider an RFP. When we, when we first started talking about this, I think I made the statement that I really couldn't make a decision based upon what was given us in, initially. I think this uh, additional information is helping me to uh, understand a little bit better. and. Uh, I, and although this may not be the exact place, I'm not sure we want to do an RFP. But in answer to this one, um, I would consider closing Riverview and continue operating Walker and Crosswinds as public courses. Well, that, that was, I think, yours and Slim's yeah. opinion from the beginning, was it not? Right. Yeah. I, I think is that correct? I'd move much on this. You never do. Mayor. <laughs> yes, sir. I think that we have got to have, and it may fall in line with what Billy just stated, our city decides that we are. We need to have at least one nine hole golf course. Now, of course, we make the decision which one that is, but it looks like everything is favoring Walker over Hobson, but the city of Bone Green needs an 18-hole golf course and definitely a nine-hole golf course. Well, go ahead. I'm still concerned. All of the, I am definitely in favor of looking at closing Riverview and keeping a nine-hole course. All the comments I have received from citizens, though, um, want us to get out of the business. At Walker, um, so I'm still in favor of possibly issuing RFPs. Well, uh, they are, are we going to proceed then, or are we still come up in the air about it? Can we do number eight, please? Well, that's that's where we are. Yes. Oh, sir. okay. I mean, that's not the question that we're at, but that's that's the question I'm asking. I mean. I know we started with, with two probably knows anyway and, and have ended up in that location is pretty much a definite no and uh, if, if we're not going to consider it any further then I don't want to take up any more, anyone's time if we're not going to. No, the key, I mean, the key to me is uh, Hobson versus uh, Walker and it would appear that uh, Walker overshadows and has the potential uh, more so than Hobson, um, but again, I said we need at least one nine-hole golf course. 
I, th I think we're all in agreement with that. It's just whether or not the city is going to operate it or if we're going to go out for proposals. The, if we do go out for proposals, we need to go through the rest of the questions. If we do go out for proposals, that gives us the greater options and the greater opportunities to either save money or address it, but that doesn't mean that, that we accept anything. But uh, I, I want to be as, uh, as good as stewards with, with the taxpayers' money as we can have, that we can be. You know, and I've, I've been back and forth on this, but I'll go back to the uh, additional information that I've received. Um, maybe it's a, uh, an approach, and I think Kevin alluded to it, that it would take some time to close Riverview. I think, again, some more information there. Uh, maybe it's something that in the short term, and this will really muddy it up, in the short term we look at that, uh, and then, I don't know, I'm thinking out loud, which is real dangerous for everybody in here. Uh, but you think about in a couple of years, if this strategy doesn't work, you do something else. I'm not quite sure it all has to be done in one fatal swoop. I don't think I follow what you're saying. There. I didn't think you would. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I follow what I just said, to be honest with you. I'm saying that, that in the answer to number eight. Can you read out loud? Or yes. If the if city could develop strategy to eliminate deficit at Paul Walker and execute a plan of capital improvements, would you consider halting privatization of Walker? And the answer to that quite simply seems to me that yes. But I have to throw the, the part in there that I do want to save money. And I know that all of us in the room, taxpayers and staff, everybody wants to make sure we use our dollars the best that we can. But I agree with Joe about at least for now having a nine-hole golf course and an 18-hole golf course. And this is obviously is a difficult decision. We're, we're setting policy or potentially setting policy for, for the long term. And I'm saying now with the information I've received about Riverview and the possibility of maybe uh, closing that, getting the extra rounds being played at Crosswinds or, uh, or Walker, uh, eliminating some of the subsidy that we do pay to our golf program, I think that may be the compromise that we do now. If it doesn't work, you come back, whoever's sitting in these seats a couple of years from now, maybe they change their mind and say that didn't work and you go back and you try to privatize or lease Walker. Didn't help any, did it? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> but probe there, Bruce, probe. Yeah. Okay. If, uh, go ahead. Since I'm new at this, legally, if we go for RFPs, do we have to accept one? No, ma'am. Might we send the RFP that we can reject everything? So even though it would be a lot of time and effort on the city, we could receive those and kind of weigh out our options financially, what's best for the city. Yeah, just because you seek proposals does not mean you have to accept proposals. Well, we're at, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. City Manager. Yes, sir. On Hobson Grove, uh -huh. just in one or two sentences, uh, is it anything can be done to save Hobson over and above what we are already doing, subsidizing, and so on and so on. In other words, if we keep Hobson, it's our baby, along with the uh, laws of rounds and money going out to pay for it, right? Um, I'm glad you're asking this question. Uh, uh, I think Bob is prepared to answer this question also. If you privatize uh, Paul Walker, it's only a matter of time before you will have to close Riverview or Hobson Globe. It, it just, I'm not, Bob, you agree? Without a major investment. Yeah, without a major investment. Then you, then you're, then you have debt, major investment, then you're still going to have the issue of location, price competition, and all these other kind of things. What I'd like to do, if it's okay with you all, is do number eight and do the RFP and let us compete because I think there's a strategy for us to uh, 
create a nice golf course at Paul Walker and one at Crosswinds, uh, thoughtfully close Riverview over time and have a one nine hole course and one 18 hole course and eliminate the deficit at Walker by doing so. I think that's possible. Brent, say that one more time. I think it is possible. We have a deficit at Walker. Now, you, you, when you talked about number eight, you talked about issuing an RFP. Yeah, I, I'm thinking that we need to show the public that we can solve this problem without taking a deficit, and I, I think we can. But how, how we do that is by closing Riverview. That is a critical piece of closing a deficit of Paul Walker. It's a critical piece. So we're, what we're going to do an RFP on, if, on Walker? Yeah. Uh, so we're going to do an RFP. If you want to. To either lease, manage, Walker, at the same time that we're going to, as you say, thoughtfully close down Riverview. That's what your recommendation is. I'm saying that we should publicly manage Paul Walker, the city itself. We should not privatize Paul Walker. We should continue to operate that. To make that viable, we need to shut down over time Riverview and to reorganize our golf division using some of Slim's ideas and other thoughts to make, have two viable golf courses. Paul Walker that would have no deficit and crosswinds, but you have to close uh, Riverview. What are you suggesting we're issuing an RFP for? Uh, do we feel a need to go to the public to, to, to compete against the private sector? Or can we just do it ourselves and present a plan to you that shows you that we can do that? Do we need to show or prove that we can eliminate the deficit? That was the idea. Do so we, we are here interested is in an RFP on Walker. Use that as how we perhaps may or may not go in privatizing Walker but in addition, we will close uh, Hobson. Yeah. I, okay. Uh, but I, I, I want to make I, sure I had it right. Yeah. I, I, say, but, that sure say that again. Yes. <laughs> he wants yeah. to. He wants to consider operating. He wants all the options, which is, I guess is what well, I'm looking I, for. I too. wanted to do an RFP actually on both Riverview and Paul Walker. Okay, but I think the final solution is this. I think that we should continue to operate Paul Walker with public employees. Now, in order to do that, we got to say to the public, we can do that without deficit, right? That's okay. Linda saying. Now, how do we do that? We do that by closing Riverview over time. We have to live, leave Riverview open because we also got to do capital improvements at Paul Walker. Now, if the other part, the part about doing the RFP, if you feel a need to prove to the public without that you, you can only do that by having the private sector, have us compete against the private sector, we could throw the RFP in there. Or we could just say, city manager, come back with a plan that eliminates the deficit of Paul Walker, keeps it in public ownership, and uh, closes Riverview over time. Deficit and Hobson. Yes. And keep uh, Paul Walker. But, uh, I, I Which think would, uh, if I understand it, you don't, we don't have to send out anything if that's no. the case. No, I'm just saying the only reason you would do an RFP if you feel politically that somehow you got to show the public that we, we are being transparent and it's, made the private sector an opportunity to bid and all that. But we and staff have studied this and we feel that if we can close the Riverview over time that we could eliminate the deficit at Paul Walker, make the improvements there, and go on. But the, the, the casualty will be the closure of Riverview over time. When you close Riverview, you save $150,000. The deficit at Paul Walker is what, according to that chart, five years, 56,000? So we're already 100,000 to a good. You got 10,000 rounds. How much money is that, Jeff? We think it could be at least $100,000 or better. Okay. Now, if we got 70% of that, 60% of that, you have to factor all this out. Then you have to add in the capital improvement plan. Part of the RFP, the attraction we're here, is that somebody said, 
hey, I will fix the golf course too. Didn't they say that? So publicly, do we have to fix the golf course in order to satisfy the public's need that we've done everything that we can? Can I throw in what I was talking about is if that plan didn't work in X number of years, two years, three, whatever number it is, if this doesn't work, then you go back to square one, you deal with Walker. So you're in saying- In two or three years, in whatever time that is. Basically- Yes, sir. Basically, another way to put this is, they, we've used this term before, by issuing an RFP, it's pretty much, you've exhausted all options. It's more or less due diligence. You've explored every facet of this whole complex issue and you wait to see what that RFP comes back. You may have one proposal, you may have a dozen, but you may have one or you may have both courses. But it basically, it exhausts, like I said, all, all your options. It's due diligence. We've, we've, we, can, we can, when we step away, we can say we've, we've done everything we can. We've looked at it every which way we can and you go from there. In, in, inherent in Jeff's thought of that, which is good, the due diligence, is it can't be for a flat fee. Why would we give up our best assets, all these rounds, and give them away for a, a, a capitated risk to a private vendor? That makes no sense to me. Uh, that's, that's, but, but I have I'm, not done golf course leases, but that's what I do for a living. Everything is a, is a flat fee. I'm, the proposal on on uh, making a percentage makes it very difficult because I know the amount of accounting that we have to do to come up with our figures on the management program at the at the convention center. Well, the RFP is drafted basically gives an option: flat fee, percentage, or a combination of the both. Could be a flat fee within some kind of a, a percentage based upon exceeding a hundred thousand dollars in gross revenue. There's a thousand ways they could they could propose, but let me go back. Could maybe come back from the opposite end of this too, because I mean I don't want to. I mean I'm not sitting up here and I don't want to interpret what you are saying, but you're right. We can go out on, on RFP and not accept, but at the same time, you know, if I'm reading up here and there's not interest in doing, I mean, people are going to have to spend time and money coming up these proposals, staff time to review the proposals, you know, advertising, people taking the time to do this. You know, if there's if there's not if we're just spinning our wheels, I'm not sure it's worth doing that. If there's not three people up here interested in doing that, it may be better just to make the decision now and, and, and move on. Otherwise, we'll do what you want to do. But you know, it would be bad to make everybody jump through all these hoops if if we've already have three people who say we're not going to privatize Walker. But on the other hand, you could get a private RFP with somebody who says we're going to give you a hundred and fifty thousand dollars for both of your courses. Please let us have it. It's a diamond in the rough. I, I think, I think, go ahead. I, it probably won't happen, but <laughs> I, that's the question. That's the political question you guys got to ask. On one hand, you have, you don't want to uh, mess with people and have them do an RFP that may not be competitive, especially if it's a flat fee, uh, or uh, give up the opportunity to maybe make uh, a proposal that has a lot of uh, some money in it for the city. I, I, I don't know. I, I want to revisit one thing, and, and I don't mean to take us back to a, a, a point we've already discussed, but in Mr. DeFebo's comments just a few short minutes ago, he talked about that it's our goal to operate golf with no subsidy. I, I think that is a, a, a constant goal always uh, I think as and, and of the, when, when you looked up to the Commission I saw one person in Commissioner Hill who was nodding yes I, I didn't see anybody else who was nodding yes although I'm not trying to suggest that others don't don't want us to operate at a subsidy and I want us to operate as efficiently as possible and if that means no subsidy that's great but what we can't lose sight of and, and for some reason because Golf becomes the target, and I'm going to use the word target because it becomes a target that it is somehow a sport of elitists. And, and because it's a sport for elitists, then the elitists should pay for it and there should be no subsidy. But I'd like to point out that if we're going to talk about eliminating subsidies, I've only picked from your chart those that are over $100,000. F.O. Moxley Center, 
Parker Bennett, special populations, soccer, softball, baseball, and ranking in at the top is the cemetery at a subsidy of $389,332 that the city pays every year to bury people. And, and I, I, I get a little passionate about it because I've made no bones. I, 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 don't, I don't play poker very well. I don't hide my cards. I, I'm a golfer. I've grown up playing the game. That's not why I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about it because for the same reason that I thought skaters got picked on because of the way they looked, I think golf gets picked on because of the way that people perceive the sport. And if we're going to talk about eliminating subsidies in the city, then let's start talking about apples and apples. But I don't think, and boy, I'll, you think I'm passionate about golf, we want to start talking about eliminating special populations because it costs us $203,000. I'll get angry. I think a lot of people will. So l let's not lose sight of the fact over and over and over again that at least in my opinion, and I believe at least some segment of the population agrees with me, that it is government's responsibility to provide a service. And services come at a cost. Whether it's golf or special populations or burying people at Fairview Cemetery. It, it comes at a cost. It's why people pay taxes. Nobody likes to pay taxes, but everybody does. And in return for paying taxes, they expect a service. In some cases, that's golf. In some cases, it's burying people. In some cases, it's a road that takes you to and from the grocery store. But, but I think it's unfair, even though we're specifically talking about golf, to spend, to, to make the statement that we want to operate without a subsidy and pick on one sport yeah. or, or one program that the city offers. I, I, I misspoke. I, I, think I, I, don't, I don't think you misspoke. Well, I, I'm not criticizing I, I, I anybody. Misspoke. I'm just trying to be I clear. think we can eliminate the deficit at Walker. There's no doubt. We're always going to have, depending on weather, play, et cetera, a, a, some minor deficit or uh, a deficit at uh, Crosswinds. We, we thought that was value acceptable. What we thought was hemorrhaging was Riverview. It is. It's okay. hemorrhaging. It, it's, and there's no way to fix it unless you're going to invest a lot of money, then it, it, there's no way out. I think the question on the table at this point is, uh, are we going to, uh, I think we're all on, on agreement that Hobson is closing in a transitional sense. Now our question on the table is do we simply take those funds and work on Walker or do we look, I mean, and have Mr. DeFebo and the uh, Parks and Recreation staff work to make it as uh, efficient and uh, less of a subsidy as possible or do we want to look at every option by issuing an RFP and see if there is an opportunity there to keep Hobson open as well as uh, run uh, Covington Woods as well. So that, that's, I think that's a question where we are. Is that correct, Mr. Febber? Yeah, I think that's pretty, pretty well done. Uh, so, uh, Mayor, uh, it is not going to hurt a thing if we ask for a proposal. Right? No, sir, right. I don't believe so. It just no, take up staff it's time not going to hurt a thing, but the proposal got to be a good proposal. For example, if you have people who are only going to give us a flat fee for money for the use of, of, of uh, Paul Walker, it, it, let's, stop, let's stop it now. Yeah, I understand. Well, I, I'm just trying to clear my mind is the fact that if we ask for a proposal, and we're asking for one proposal on Walker and Hobson. And or. And or. or. Uh, it, we, it hasn't hurt a thing. We're going to make a decision as to what we want. Uh, let's do that. And yep. maybe that person will give $150 million for both. And we're we'll meeting him mm -hmm. on the road halfway. Then at the same time, maybe we're playing against ourselves. We would like to as a public company present an option ourselves. Sure. That's what we'd like to present an option ourselves. That we would close a review, we would come up with different synergies for Paul Walker, 
different okay, uh, management that. structure in the future, uh, it's up to you. The question is, do you do an RFP or not an RFP? Uh, do you wait for us to present a plan to see if it's any good, or do you say we got to play every option and we have to go out to an RFP? Uh, that's a political question. I, I don't know. I think I'm looking at everybody and, and I'm getting nods that we want to look at every option that we ought not to, to uh, eliminate the opportunity for an RFP because we don't know what somebody may or may not bid or for one or both golf courses or maybe an option to resurrect that to Hobson Grove as well. In the same manner, I'm of the opinion that the RFP needs to be as flexible as possible because we don't know what options there are available out there. Uh, and, th and there may be an opportunity that, that you know, none of us have been smart enough to think of that, that somebody who wants to present something to us would work. Um, so are we all on board with that? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna go out to an RFP that's as we have it written. And then staff is also gonna do some due diligence to come up with some ideas also as an alternative. Yes. Is that acceptable or? Mm -hmm. I agree, and I'd just like to respond to what Slim said as far as these other subsidies. Um, I've made a note in this notebook to definitely look at these during budget time. I mean, I think we're not doing the citizens justice if we don't look at ways to reduce all subsidies. So, I agree, it may look like we're picking on golf right now, and I don't want that at all. No, it's only because this proposal was right. brought to our attention. We're I understand. Not, yes. I just don't want to. I, I, the majority of the people who've contacted me have contacted me in support of golf. They have. But, but I have received some. I, I received a tweet during the meeting that said, sell the course. Uh, what I can tell you, I, what, I just it came into my phone, Katie, before you throw some kind of legal <laughs> language at me. You uh, disclosed it, so it's public record now. Go that's ahead. right. Uh, but what I don't, I, I just think that I just want an apples to apples kind of comparison, and that's it. But 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 I wasn't trying to say we should start slashing and burn. Look, nobody moves to Bowling Green, Kentucky because we cut services. Nobody. There isn't anybody out there in America, there isn't any industry who says, man, I'm going to Bowling Green. They, they, they cut services better than anybody else. That, that's, not, that's not what causes people to move to a community or to enjoy living in a community. And, and people pay taxes for a reason. They pay, they pay taxes in the expectation that they're going to receive services. What that means is that sometimes things run, need a subsidy in order to be able to operate. That's all I'm trying to say. I know we've gone quite long, but uh, the, the only other thing uh, that hasn't been mentioned, <clears throat> and it has to do with uh, obviously a timetable. Uh, yes. I can't imagine employees, staff, and, and obviously people that are interested in this issue. Uh, what will the timetable be? This needs to, and I don't want to hurry anything, obviously, but it needs to be put to rest as soon as we can. Another week or less, we get six to six weeks uh, publicly. Yes, we will. Uh, you've got the RFP. Yes, we will. Finally, we may have a couple of things uh, to clean up, make sure all the attachments and exhibits are. Uh, we have all the information we need, but I think it's pretty well ready to go. Yeah, we need we need a minimum of seven days to advertise, and then uh, what we're about a thirty day. Yeah, um, I think we look at probably closer to thirty because we really want if we want competition, if you want this to get out and be distributed and get people to get proposals, seven days really cuts it really yeah, really yeah. short. Yeah. Um, but uh, and we we're looking at what 21 to 30 days yeah. to get people time to respond. And what I just said about the employees I, I'm, that's on everyone's mind here. I think I just interrupted and spoke at first, but uh, we're we're mindful of that as an issue. And well, regardless of what the RFP comes out, we're going to entertain at least review whatever comes in uh, is to be as open and as I I think. I'm for keeping Paul Walker and keeping Crosswinds in the public domain. I think we could close, I think we can, I'm gonna use a different term than slim. I think we can increase the cost recovery. How's that, so instead of deficit, instead of uh, the deficit. I think we can increase the cost recovery at Paul Walker and do a better, better job of putting money into Crosswinds. We, we do. 
and it, and it fits the basic thesis of the whole presentation that we have oversupply. I understand. Yeah. But I, we, we've been talking about alternatives ourselves, but we don't know if there's going to be an RFP out there that where a guy comes in and says, look, I'll take it all for 200 and some thousand dollars, <laughs> hire all your employees, do everything, blah, 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 blah. It, it might be, I don't know that. Well, I, I know we've run quite long here. It's 10 minutes till 6, but I didn't want to close the meeting unless if someone had to, uh, something that they felt that we needed to know or wanted to bring to our attention, I'd invite them to the microphone so that we could make sure we heard everyone had something to speak. Yes, sir? Come right up to the microphone. Please give us your name and address. That comment. Uh, would, would, you give us your name and would you give us your name and address, please? Rogers Powell. Yes, sir. Uh, I live here in Bowling Green, uh, Cumberland Trace area, and uh, I play golf four or five times a week. And uh, I just, uh, everything's been answered pretty much that I was going to comment on. And uh, I have to say that Mr. Nash uh, brought out the points that I had made note of about uh, not, you know, don't just look at golf. I mean, you know, some of these fellows here, uh, I mean, obviously the ones that work, uh, I hate that for them. But uh, they didn't all show up, but we have uh, quite a few fellows that I consider senior citizens, you know, they're older fellows. And, and uh, you know, I just was hoping we wouldn't have to be uh, kind of put, put on the back burner. It seems like we are quite a bit. and. Uh, but uh, it, we just don't want to get priced out of where we can play some golf. I mean, I retired uh, 42 years and was uh, moved to Bowling Green, and uh, I thought, man, I'm going to play golf from now on, but uh, it's going to be a lot harder. It's going to be a lot harder, and I hate to see that. I mean, I, not for just me, but there's some guys that like me, that's, uh, and it's going to really make it hard on us if we have to drive to Franklin or if we have to try to, you know, Anyway, I mean, that was just my remarks. Everything else was answered. Mr. Denning answered a couple of my questions about, you know, wanting to keep a nine-hole course open, and the deficit thing was really, you know, uh, we just didn't want it to all be related to, to golf, and uh, there's some that's in a whole lot worse shape than, than we are, even if we continued the way it is right now. It's not as bad as some of the others. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Would there be anyone else? Can I make a, a final more. call? Yes, I just want to thank Bob Jeffers and his staff. Mm -hmm. This was extremely difficult to ask uh, a person to give you information that could impact you personally, and he handled himself with great professionalism, as, as did this whole staff, and uh, Anna and Ernie. And uh, we looked at it as a team approach, and it was nice to have that. Thank you for all of you being here, Dr. Little. Would you like to come up? Am I going to amen at the end of it? I'm Alton Little. Uh, I'm on the Parks Board and I live in Bowling Green. There's two things I'd like to say. Number one is I, I, I dislike the word deficit because we're not dealing with a deficit. We're dealing with making a budget to operate the departments of the city of Bowling Green. And that budget goes for the services that are provided by whichever the department is. And you're not operating at a deficit. You're paying for services, regardless of the department. And I think that what we need to do is to recognize that, and Slam, I agree with what you said. Don't just pick on golf. Well, now, don't just pick on recreation either. Because you make a budget for every department. And you should not be looking at recreation any more than you're going to be looking at any other department and looking to see where monies can be cut. And I'm not advocating that you do that because I think that when you went through the budget process, I voted for you. And I voted for you because I thought that you were going to look at a budget and give us a budget that would provide the services that we as citizens want. I don't like the idea of closing Hobson. If I told you for $150,000, I could come up here and give you a youth program in golf, every one of you would probably vote for it. Slim, it's a good idea. Why not consider the possibility of taking Hobson that you would not have to keep at the level of the other golf courses 
and let that become a learner course for the youth directly to the youth with leagues, with lessons, and everything else. For $150,000, it would be the greatest investment that the city made because it's in the future of the city and the youth of the city. And if we could do that, we could have the golfers to come to the other courses. The reason we don't have them is because we're not teaching golf like we used to. We don't have the opportunity or the people that's in it. The people who are playing golf have played golf for a long time. And if we get them as young people and we get them playing, and Hobson is a good place that it can be done, it can be taught there, and it can be operated and worked. And if we're only having to have $150,000 of services, and if that can go for nothing but the youth, it'll be the best money you ever spent. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Little. Anyone else? Mr. Gary? My name is Greg Gary, and I'm the reason I guess everybody's here <laughs> tonight. Um, when I set out in this venture, you know, to look at uh, leasing the golf course at Paul Walker, um, I had in mind uh, expanding the junior golf uh, of Bowling Green and servicing the uh, senior uh, citizens. In my opinion, that's what a nine-hole golf course is supposed to do. Uh, I've said it in uh, the earlier meetings. And I think it's just time to do something. Uh, we've lost almost uh, $900,000 a year in the last eight years using uh, the city's uh, finance uh, reports that they have uh, supplied to my accountants. And uh, that was from the years 2003 to 2010. Um, using those eight years uh, the total loss divided uh, by the eight was right at nine hundred thousand dollars a year uh, using that same figure over those eight years it cost sixteen dollars and seventy cents for every man woman and child that lives inside the city limits using again the city uh, uh, supplied of the uh, population uh, average over those eight years and I'm just offering something to take part of this debt away. Um, I'm not after anybody's job or uh, not trying to say that nobody's done a good job at uh, what they've been, you know, asked to do. Uh, I just came uh, before the commission given an option to uh, relieve part of this debt at no cost uh, to the city. And... Um, I am glad that uh, I'll at least be able to make a proposal, but uh, I would say that, you know, it, you need to look as, at the proposals that you receive. Anytime you're running different entities under one large entity, uh, it's not hard to uh, do creative uh, accounting and move, you know, money from one spot to the other. Uh, and not saying that that would happen, but they've said that they've had uh, certain percentages tagged on to uh, the different courses that might not really reflect the percentage that was used at that course. And um, I mean, the numbers kind of stand uh, for what they uh, stand off of the ones that I gotten for the last four years there was right at a three hundred thousand dollar deficit at uh, walker which um, represents about seventy five thousand dollars a year uh, there was one year that they had uh, a construction cost which would have been some type of a capital improvement uh, that was in those four years but still that's that's an expense that was paid whether you uh, use it as a one time expense or uh, amortize it over five years, 10 years, whatever. Uh, it's still a cost to the taxpayers. And um, I just, you know, would again uh, ask that you take a, a hard look at all the different proposals because I think you'll be surprised at all the different uh, creative ideas that 
uh, the golfing industries uh, have, you know, across the United States. I don't expect to be the only uh, person that uh, submits a proposal, but uh, that, you know, you'll be, you'll be surprised at how creative everybody can get. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Gary. Thank you for initiating the conversation in the first place. Any other comments? If not, we'll close this meeting and reopen at 7 o'clock for a regular session. Thank you for coming.